Colossians chapter number one. I appreciate the Lord's direction, but still need more tonight. So I'm just going to trust him. Don't feel we'll be long, but I do have a thought on my heart. And I am grateful to God that he's still in the saving business. Uh, If he wasn't, he'd have already come back. Uh, There's no other purpose that Christ had to come, according to the scripture, but to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, I'll grant you this, uh, by an innumerable number, they, they die out every day. People are unprepared to meet God. But that's not because God hasn't made a way for them. They've rejected it. They've turned it away. They've, they've remained in an alienated condition to God. And friend, when you stand before him, you'll stand before him as an enemy. Colossians chapter number 1, I'll begin at verse number 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. He's speaking of Christ. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled (laughs) in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray for the unction it requires to guide us in this truth May you speak to every heart, and may the soul of those that are here, every heart, be challenged. May we be drawn by your spirit today. May we respond properly to this truth and in this simple thought. I pray that you would touch the heart of that soul that might be among us that simply not ready to meet you. We love you, and we thank you for your grace, for the mercy that caught me that day. And bought me. We praise you now for all that you're doing and all that you will do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. I want to share just a simple thought tonight about being alienated from God. we go all the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis when Christ had created all things. And that's what the apostle was sharing here in Colossians concerning our creator. He spoke of it directly. But that was when that whole alienation began. Adam and Eve being in the garden, Eve beguiled by the serpent, simply disobeyed the word of God believed the lie of the enemy, and in that instant was alienated from God. What Adam and Eve had experienced up to that point can only be described in my heart or in my mind by what we're going to experience when we get there one day, when we walk with him and we talk with him and we are in union forevermore. Right? We'll never leave. We'll never be away from him at that point. What a glorious thought. What a wondrous truth that he's promised us. And we feel that in our hearts in part at least. The Apostle Paul willing to say we now yet see through a glass darkly. 
We've not yet fully seen what is coming. We've not yet been able to really recognize or worship him for the truth of what, what, will, what will pass when we are in his presence and face to face. When no longer will we be alienated from God. The term redemption indicates that something has been purchased, but also that it has been taken, that it's been received unto himself. And Jesus made the statement to his disciples, I go away to prepare you a place, and if I go away, I will come again, and I'll receive you unto myself. Now, that's the redemption of our bodies. That's the redemption of us when Christ will have gathered all unto himself. I want you to think tonight about what it means to be alienated. What the apostle said in this particular chapter, verse number 21, and you, and I certainly believe he's speaking to us, to each one of us, to each one of those that are in the midst of us tonight whose hearts may be bound by the wickedness of this world. And uh, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to get lost uh, according to the word of God, we were already dead in our sins and trespasses toward God. We were alienated from God through the, through the nature that we inherited but through Adam. And all of these things simply something that brings us to a place where uh, one day when the Holy Spirit touches our heart, we're able to realize that not only did he send his son to die for us, but he made a way for us to be reconciled back unto him. To understand where we're uh, at tonight, I want to go back again and try to see the separation that was made that day. What a dreadful and what a horrible thing to when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden when they fell and the, and, and the Bible said that they realized in that very instant that they had fallen, that sin was present in them and that uh, they had separated themselves from God. You see, the Bible said the first thing they did was begin to hide their sin and then they began to hide themselves or oh, the alienation that comes from sin and how it works in our lives. I was uh, sharing with somebody yesterday and they were telling me of, of, of this hard thing that had took place and it occurred to me that sin is to blame. It's always to blame. It's the very thing that separates us from the love of God, the presence of God, the peace of God, the power of God, all of these things are ours as children of God, but sin separates us from that. And all the alienation from God is so dark and lonely. Being alienated from God, having no way to get back. It's as if we were dropped off in the middle of nowhere with no map, no compass, no light. And having no idea how to find that light, we're simply trusting that someone will find us. That someone will come looking for us. Adam and Eve had fallen in the garden. The Bible said that they were cast out of the garden. After he had prepared coats of skin for them to wear, the Bible said that he cast them both from the garden and you know they were never allowed back in it. The alienation that comes when we separate ourselves from God, when sin separates us from him, an alienation that is so grievous that the apostle would say we were enemies to Christ. We were enemies to God. There was nothing good about us, nothing that within our hearts that, that would cause us him to merit or his favor, nothing within us that would uh, cause a Christ to love us. And yet we find that in our alienated condition, Jesus loved me anyway. He saw me where I was at and he came to me, alienated from God, alienated without hope, no way to get to God. Can we see tonight that being alienated and enemies of God, there was was no hope if Christ did not come. If he didn't come looking for me, there was no way to be saved. The apostle Paul would say, and you. Yeah. And that is who we were when we had not Christ before we were saved. That's who we were. We were alienated from Christ and we were enemies to God. And may I say today, if you die in that condition, that is how you'll stand before God. There's not another opportunity beyond this day. There's not another chance beyond this hour, beyond this time that we're aware of. There is nothing that you can be promised but now and this moment in time. Today is the day of salvation. The alienation that 
that separated Adam from God could only be breached by Christ. The only way that we could be made whole and united with Christ again was something had to be done with my sin. My sin was the problem. My sin was the debt load. My sin was the one thing that I couldn't get past. My sin was something I couldn't pay for. I couldn't resurrect myself. I couldn't reconcile myself. I couldn't make myself whole. I couldn't forgive myself of sin. And yet Jesus came to do all of that for me. Jesus came to bring me who was alienated from God by sin. Jesus came that day to resurrect in my heart a life that couldn't be extinguished by the dark of this world. He came to reconcile me back to God, you see. Restored unto me the joy of that salvation. Gave unto me that day a hope in my heart. Gave me eternal life and give me something, friend, that nobody else could do. He forgave me of my sin. The very thing that alienates us from God still is sin. Even as Christians today, we can find ourselves in circumstances where it feels as if God is a thousand miles away. We know the truth of God, that the Spirit of God never leaves us nor forsakes us. It's always present with us, but oh, doesn't it feel horrible when we allow sin to be present in our lives? Do we not become alienated in our own minds and the deeds of our flesh? Do we not become enemies in our heart to Christ when sin abides and it rules in our hearts? Are we not to be reminded every day of the dangers of sin and what it can do in our lives? It will alienate you still if you mess with sin. And yet every day we find the precious peace of God by simply repenting of this sin. John would say it like this, that if we would confess our sins, that he was faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He can forgive of sin today, the very thing that alienates us from God, that keeps our hearts from experiencing the joy of salvation, the peace that God alone can give, the very wonder in our hearts to a God that will love the sinner. And yet what we know is it's still sin that separates. Oh, that our heart could be awakened to the dangers of sin itself, that we as God's people wouldn't live as if we don't know the truth, but would recognize that at every corner of our life is a temptation and a sin, a wager to draw us into the darkness of this world. Oh, we cannot be unsaved. I want you to know sin can still separate you. It can alienate you from God today. In my dark, lost condition, I was alienated and an enemy to God. And yet I find today when we allow sin to be present in our lives where it has no right to be, where it has no right to be, and it has no power over me. I'm dead to sin. If sin is present in my life, you can be assured of this. I let it in, and I allow it to be there. I'm not lost I'm not undone without God. I'm not missing the Holy Spirit and its presence and ability to guide and direct and convict and show me where sin abounds. Oh, it's it's my fault if sin is there. It's our fault when sin is present. And it will alienate you today. It'll alienate you first from God when you start to feel in your heart that you're indifferent to God and the things of God. It's what happens. It's the first step of backsliding against God is when sin begins to reign in your heart and it alienates you from God. It'll alienate you from the, from the God that saved you, from the fellowship that comes with knowing him as Christ and Lord and Savior. It'll alienate you from the very peace that God gives in his presence. It'll alienate you from the joy that comes from being forgiven and free of sin. Sin will alienate you from the God that has redeemed your soul from the darkness of this world. We need to allow sin in our lives. We need to treat it as the cancer that it is. We need to stop it when we see it, pray through it, but get rid of sin because it'll alienate you. Its purpose is to alienate, to destroy, to kill. And sin still does this work. 
what a dangerous thing to mess around with the sinful things of this world as if there's no recompense or reward from it. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're excluded or exempt from the pain that comes from following sinful deeds. What a dangerous thought that because we've been born again, we somehow have a license to do whatever we want. That's a lie from hell. According to the word of God, I cannot no more live in sin because I am dead to that sin. When we allow sin in our life, it is the rebellion and the pride of our own heart and that sin is grievous to God. We need to repent of it. The littlest of things can be what opens the door to it. An indifference to God, an indifference to his house. We become alienated from the things of God, but we also become alienated. We alienate ourselves from the people of God. One of the first things we'll do as a backslider is we'll separate ourselves from the house of God because it's an uncomfortable place to be. When you go into the house of God, and if you're alienated, if you're backslid, you go into the house of God, you're looking around. Everybody else is enjoying what they've got, and you're not. You're experiencing the, the pain and the suffering. Oh, to God, that we could. Well, I don't ever have to live not a day that way. There is never a day I have to live that way. No, it's the pride and the rebellion of our own hearts wanting to do it our way. Want to walk the way we want to walk. Do what we want to do. That's what alienates us from God first, but then the church. Oh, when you alienate yourself, friend, from those two things, the very joy that your soul craves has been extinguished. It's been taken from you. You ever been to the place where you felt like you'd gone so far that there was no way you'd ever feel God's spirit again? The most terrifying day of my life. <laughs> you say day, yeah, I didn't let it go no farther than that. I don't want to live that way. Oh, to God, that we could recognize that the sin of this world is but for a season. Yeah. And its pleasures have no lasting value. Oh, that we could recognize that this flesh is but a deceiver and it always has been. My flesh longs for nothing but the things of this world and it wants the things of this world. But may I say to you today, all of those things are contrary to the will of God and the purpose of God and I've never had joy in my life when I was in sin. The pleasures of sin may last for a season at all, but the price you have to pay or the cost, the great cost of doing it your way having it your way, doing what you want to do. There's a price tag for sin. And you, he said, were alienated. You were. You were alienated. And you were enemies to Christ before he saved you. But I've been brought out of that. The very day that he wrote my name in his book and made me his own, I was made a new creature. I believe today that there's a responsibility for us to live the way that God has called us to live. That we have no right nor license to live any other way than but according to the mandates of the Holy Scriptures, the very things that give us life and empowers the salvation within us, we are to mind the Lord and to obey Him. And everything He's called me into is for my own good, it is for my joy, it is for my peace. And all of these things, if we'll do them, we'll experience, we'll experience the joy of it, we'll experience the peace. But sin separates. Oh, I don't think it's, just look around you, right? Look to your left and look to your right. How many people are missing today? You know what got them? Sin. Sin, it's dangerous. No, it's so contagious and wicked. It's so cancerous and infectious. Do you know, Greg, that just one day in it can start an infection in your soul that can take weeks if we don't deal with it, to recover. To some, it seems it's taken years and they're still not recovered. 
it's dangerous to mess with it. You take these things as a fire into the bosom, you're going to get burned. There's no way around it. You can't sow something and reap something different. Sin has a price tag. And you can be sure that your sin will find you out. How many times, how many days of our lives have been wasted and of no effect, they have no eternal relevance and glory, right? Days that are wasted because we spent them for self. We spent them at, at the price of our own heart, at the price of our own joy. We lived in sin too long. The psalmist would pray in Psalms 53 as he repented unto God. And he'd say, search me, O God, and try my thoughts. Know my heart. See if there's any wicked way within me and purge me from all of this. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Listen, I don't know about you, but the best, the best experience of life is being able to have victory over sin to be able to say unto the tempter what Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, oh, how many days have we sacrificed for this world and this flesh that we will lose eternal value of because we did not deal with sin. Sin comes into our lives and I'm, I'm almost done. But sin comes into our lives and it begins to steal and to rob so many of those things that are precious and only heaven bought. The very things that some would give all they had to have. The very peace of God that some would give their fortunes just to sleep with one night. The peace of God. Joy. And we have it in abundance. And yet every day that we compromise with sin, it is stolen from us. It is stripped from us as sure, as sure as a light from a candle burns. You can be certain that when we meddle with sin, it will steal something of a greater value while present. Some live with regrets today. No, we all live with regrets today. And those regrets are like scars. I've got a visible scar right here and got a couple on my hands. And when you see those, I can tell you that they don't hurt, right? You can touch them, but they remind me of the pain. They remind me of a time when it costed me. A time when suffering was real. And that's what regret does. It reminds us of those times that we should not have been where we were. We should have not been doing what we were doing. We should have not have compromised with the word of God or those things in our life. Listen, it's dangerous to mess around with sin. It has no respect of person. The destroyer today cares nothing for your soul. Would just as soon you die than live. It's by the grace of God that he doesn't have us. It's by the protection of God, the sealing of the spirit of God. All of these things keep us from the hands of the tempter. So how ridiculous is the thought that we would invite him in to our house. After all that God has done to keep us from the clutches and the ultimate payment of sinful living for us to be in our rebellious spirit, live for our flesh. I'll say this, come and get a song. The worst feeling that, that I know of is being lost 
and knowing it. In itself, by definition, that's alienated and realizing it. Right? We, we were happy as birds as long as we didn't know we were lost. We lived as wicked and did whatever we wanted to do and didn't bother us. We slept just fine. But the day I got lost, I realized that I was alienated from God and that there was something between me and God that I couldn't move. But he came to me that day through his blood He was able to pay the penalty of my sin. And he was able to breach that great chasm and reach me. He was able to extend his hand way below the bottom and snatch me from those flames that I was bound for. And he lifted me up that day. And he set me up on a solid rock. And by that single and miraculous work of salvation, he established my goings. And I'm going to escape hell today. And to me, all that Christ has done to make me one of his own makes my willful sin An embarrassing, hateful thing. After all he's done, after all he's done for me to live one moment for the flesh is unacceptable. It's grievous. And it ought to break our heart. It ought to break our heart when we find ourselves alienated with sin. We ought to be able to cry, oh God, I'm so sorry. Oh, that the old God would return to our prayer life. Oh, God, help me. The world needs to see a peculiar people. They already see the world. They don't need to see the world in you. You can spend a life building a testimony to lose it in just a moment. Every opportunity or influence you might have had can be squandered with a simple Poor, wicked choice. I don't want to be alienated from God. As a matter of fact, I need Him. I'm just desperate. I need Him. I need Him in so many ways. I need Him. There ain't any of us can afford a day of alienation from God. But sin separates you. Sin separates you. Sin takes your peace. Sin takes your joy. Sin takes everything that's precious to the child of God. And the only way to get it back is to be reconciled. And reconciliation today comes through a simple process. The apostle said it like this, and we'll sing here. When he wrote to the Corinthians in the first epistle, he had to get on to them. Why? Because they was living in sin. They'd, they'd compromised with the world and sin had crept in. And it had alienated some of them in a pretty severe way. And Apostle Paul dealt with it in First Corinthians. and He spoke quite clearly but directly concerning their sin. But then in 2 Corinthians, he writes back to them. I love 2 Corinthians. 
And Paul said, I was glad when I heard you were made sorry. I'm so glad when you get sorry. Paul said, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't glad because of your sorrow. He said, but I sure was glad at what that sorrow produced. He said, for cause your sorrow was a godly sorrow. It was of a godly sort. And he said, that godly sorrow worked repentance that need not be repented of. He was able to rejoice in the repentance of, of the Corinthians because they had heard his word and when it convicted their heart, they were sorry. They repented to God and were restored. The joy that Paul writes back to them in 2 Corinthians, he would say in chapter 5, that we've all been given this ministry of reconciliation. God's come and he's reconciled you to himself through the blood of his only son. And he said to each one of us, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So Paul would say in verse number 20, I believe it was, he'd say, therefore, in Christ's Dead, I say to you, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Are you sorry tonight for sin? Listen, you think, oh, I, I don't want these people to know I have sin. You don't actually think any believes that you're not a sinner that you don't have sin. The question is, is are you dealing with your sin? We all have sin, but we have got to repent. Every day we've got to be honest with God and die out to those things that we fail to do or, or do and shouldn't. But God's given us an amazing advocate. And I've never been in front of my advocate when I was sorry that he didn't say, it's all been forgiven and restored me just like the father did the prodigal. Put the robe back on me, the ring back on my finger, the shoes back on my feet. God will restore all the enemy has taken today, at least what can be restored. But you'll have to be sorry for your sin. Are you sorry tonight? Do you need to pray as we stand and sing? If you're here and need the Lord, Give me an invitation to repent tonight. The greatest privilege we have is to go into the holiest of holies and to say to God ourselves, I'm so sorry. Would you come? Mm -hmm.